I was excited to sit down and talk to Howard Lux recently. Now, Howard is an MD. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and he also is a avid researcher and writer about longevity. Now, Howard has recently published a book called Longevity Simplified, and what I love about his book, and one of the primary reasons I wanted to talk to him is, as the name implies, he has simplified the actionable steps that a person can take to optimize for longevity, and that's going to address cardiovascular fitness, musculoskeletal fitness, and the thing about Howard being a orthopedic surgeon is he's seen firsthand how your musculoskeletal health impacts your longevity, your health span, and your lifespan, and so I think that he and I first met on Twitter and saw a lot of things eye to eye uh, based on that, and it's because I also think that your strength, your musculoskeletal health, play a vital role in aging successfully, and not just aging successfully, but navigating life and living successfully and at a high level in general. Uh, I highly encourage you to check out the book, Longevity Simplified. This is the book that I would suggest you gift to someone if you want to give them a roadmap to improving their health without getting too um, deep in the weeds when it comes to the science. There's not a lot of uh, overly technical talk. Now, it's not dumbed down by any means, um, but it's something that I think most people will be able to read the book. They'll be able to understand all the concepts, and they'll be able to institute them uh, quickly and easily, and it definitely can make a difference. There's no fluff. There's no filler. Outstanding book. Uh, please enjoy my interview with Howard Lux. All right, I'm excited today to be interviewing Howard Lux. And uh, Howard is, is a doctor that I stumbled upon on Twitter, not sure exactly how, um, but his content uh, kind of stood out to me right away. Um, at that point, he was working on a new book, which had not uh, been released yet. Um, but his content is very um, based in sound science as far as from what I've seen from reading the book. Um, but what it stood out to me about it was the fact that it is something you can read, you can apply with, with absolute minimal barriers to entry. Um, it focuses on the big levers that you can pull to help optimize lifestyle for the purposes of trying to age as well as possible, extending health span, and hopefully lifespan. Um, so I'd like to start with you explaining, I mean, yes, you're a doctor, but what, what brought you to medicine, and then from there, what brought you into your pursuit of, you know, health span, longevity, and then wanting to distill that and bring it, you know, to, to an audience? <laughs> Thanks, Jared. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I think our uh, methods uh, are very similar, right? You preach the same on the strength building side, right? I can teach you to do this uh, without expensive equipment uh, and, any, and any craziness uh, that we've all uh, unfortunately, unfortunately wasted a lot of money on in our, in our past decades. Um, so again, I'm happy to be here with you. Why did I become a doctor? Um, I didn't graduate college as a physician. I graduated as a chemist, um, tried that, didn't like it. Um, got a master's degree for one of the jobs I was uh, performing. And it was in basic medical sciences, exposed to a lot of medical students. I figured, what the hell? Um, and so I transitioned uh, and applied to medical school. Based on my uh, athletic endeavors uh, and the number of times that I saw my orthopedist, which was frequently more than I saw my pediatrician, uh, or orthopedics was a natural space for me. Uh, I was an athlete. I thought I understood the athlete mindset. Um, and at least early on, I figured, all right, something's broken, surgery, fix it. Uh, as you know, uh, I've changed <laughs> with regards to that. Um, longevity space, you know, how do you know, physicians are not trained in longevity. We're not trained in managing health span. We're not necessarily trained in managing the whole person. Um, so that that came about uh, <clears throat> quite a number of years ago, uh, shortly after I had, uh, uh, after we had our second child. Um, we were 
outmaneuvered and outweighed. Uh, so uh, a lot more effort uh, had to be uh, given at home, which didn't leave me time to, for my running, my cycling, and everything else. I hadn't had a chance to put to build my gym out in my basement yet. So I gained weight. Um, one day I happened to have some abdominal pain. So I saw a radiologist in the hallway and they threw me on the ultrasound table and they ultrasounded me. They said, oh, you're fine. Your gallbladder is great. It's just a little fat in your liver. <clears throat> so they brushed it off because back then, you know, it wasn't termed, uh, it wasn't termed fatty liver disease or, or non-alcoholic fatty liver. Uh, so I started reading uh, and everything that I read uh, wasn't good. You know, it talked about metabolic health, etc. And I didn't really even know what metabolic health was at that point. And there certainly wasn't a focus on it in this space. Um, there wasn't even a social space at that point either. So I just started to read more. That brought me to insulin resistance. Uh, and that, that brought me into the dementia world, uh, the world of cardiac disease and more. Um, and for me, uh, in order for me to learn something, I have to write about it. So yeah, after doing a lot of research, I started to write these articles. I put the articles up on my website. Um, I had them closed for a while or private, uh, and I started to open them up. And pretty soon they started to become quite popular. Uh, many people started to reach out. You should write a book. But then, then the pandemic came and I had the time to do that. Um, but how do I use this in my everyday world? Um, I guess around the same time that uh, my own health started to deteriorate, uh, you started to notice trends. Um, a lot of the people in front of me were on the same three medications, right? Um, a lot of them were suffering from the same diseases. Uh, and I was starting to connect all the dots on my own, in my own research. Right, that everything, uh, most of the diseases that we're going to die from have a common root cause. Um, and in many respects, that's, that is metabolic dysfunction. Um, and the root cause of that is poor mitochondrial function, poor energy partitioning, poor mitochondrial flexibility. These are just, uh, just some of the terms that folks will encounter when they research this. Um, and then I started to think, you know, maybe there's a connection between what I'm seeing uh, in the office and all these or orthopedic issues. And it turns out there was, right? We know that tendon tears are more common in people with poor metabolic health. We know that osteoarthritis is more common. We know that osteoporosis is worse and more common. Um, so there are a lot of downstream consequences to poor metabolic health, not only for our brain, our heart, our kidneys, the liver, our pancreas, etc., but for our musculoskeletal system as a whole. So I started to incorporate what I was reading into what I was sharing with patients. Um, and <clears throat> that's a very tough messaging proposition, right? How do you communicate this to your patients? You, you can't just say, eat less sugar right. and walk more. Um, that doesn't incentivize many. Um, and this had a lot to do with how I crafted the message in my book too. <clears throat> because if people understand the why, why does this work? Why does this improve my ability to age better and healthier and longer? Um, then they'll frequently engage because something clicks in their, in their mind. Um, so when I started to connect the dots, I started to notice that more and more patients bought in uh, and they went on this journey with me. And some of those were some of the greatest successes that I had in my office, right? I didn't touch them with a scalpel, but um, not only did I, I change their lives, um, I improved their lifespan, their health span. And more often than not, probably the health span and lifespan of those in their family, because they bring everyone along with them on right. their journey. Right? If they're going to be walking, so is the rest of the family. Uh, if they're going to be working out in the basement, so is the rest of the family. Um, so that became really uh, 
one of the ma major um, benefits or bonuses to being a physician and to be to being to engaging people uh, about the person centric or entire uh, person ho holistic approach to my little part of the orthopedic surgery world. That that was probably I would imagine a surprise to some patients, right? Because you you go to your family doctor or, or your primary care, and you think of that person's being more of the doctor over your, your general health. Um, and then you go to an orthopedist and it's, well, this is a specialist. So, you know, somebody's going in, Hey doc, I think I need surgery. Uh, you know, what, what's my MRI say? And then, you know, I'm sure some people were like expecting you to come back and say, well, <laughs> this is the procedure. And instead it's like, well, here, here's right. the exercise prescription. And here's, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I could, I could imagine that there was some shock there. Um, but what you just said, brings up something that I've noticed or, or came to the conclusion of over the years is that the treatment methods for many common um, conditions when it comes to connective tissue seem to be changing or have changed. And, and that's one of the things I, I loved about your stuff early on is, you know, you, you have articles and people can go to your website, check them out. We'll put um, show notes for them. Uh, but you have articles talking about, hey, you may not need surgery for you know, th this particular injury, there's a rehabilitation, maybe the right choice in, in more cases than we used to think. Uh, and so if you could maybe, because you're the expert in this area, um, you know, loading our, our body, loading our connective tissues is how we strengthen them. So when an injury, depending on severity, uh, once some maybe initial inflammation and pain have subsided, subsided enough, um, people need to get back to loading uh, to promote healing but they need to do it in a manner where it's, it's progressive, but not too much, not too quickly, and not at too, too high of an intensity, so that the body can actually adapt to this loading and the tendons can, can basically heal, um, and, and the portions that can't heal, because sometimes they can't, new, new tissues are formed around it, you, you regain integrity and strength of the tendon. Can you maybe just touch on, you know, because I think a lot of people when it comes to those connective tissue injuries, that they, they think rest, ice, ibuprofen and then surgery right they don't always realize that it's it's load that you need right much more much more involved so first to go back to to the last statement these are very challenging con conversations in in the office um and surprisingly many people are open to it so they'll talk about longevity they they'll take my suggestions to heart. Uh, they'll do some lab tests. Uh, I may refer them out to an expert. Um, so more and more, again, if you explain the why and the how and how this is interconnected, <clears throat> you'll 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 typically generate buy-in. Uh, you may annoy a few people too, but that's okay. Uh, it's all part of the learning sure. process. So. Um, in my world, I'm predominantly a runner. I'm a very average cyclist. I was a decent runner in my days, but I never podiumed. But still, I would run some crazy uh, trail races, um, and I just enjoyed finishing them and not having anything broken. But in running and training for distance, uh, it is really clear mo in most runners and cyclists, etc. Most injuries are training errors, right? It's, we were poor at, at managing load. Uh, we didn't understand recovery. We didn't understand rest. We didn't respect our need to do so. Um, and I'm guilty of this as well, uh, especially in my older years. Um, the faster that I ramp my loads, <clears throat> the more likely I am to be injured. Um, I have a post on my website about deconditioning and rest. And, and there are very few injuries that require absolute rest. Um, stress fractures and others uh, come to mind. But most soft tissue injuries don't. They do require a change in load management, perhaps a change in the type of load that's being applied. Um, perhaps they need a few days just to calm down if a tendon is really hot. <clears throat> But deconditioning occurs very rapidly. 
um, it will surprise you uh, at how rapidly it, it does occur. Um, for example, you know, I think you know I had COVID about six weeks ago, and <clears throat> I was vaccinated only about four days prior to COVID. So my inflammation had started to react to the vaccine, not enough to prevent me from getting sick. Then I got sick, so I got a double hit. Um, <clears throat> and even after I cleared the virus, uh, the effects on me were brutal. Uh, tachycardia, shortness of breath, etc. So I didn't run or cycle for six weeks. Uh, and I started up at the end of last week, you know, running one mile, uh, cycling for 20 right. minutes. Um, and I can feel it, you know, not only in my breathing and my heart rate, uh, but I'm sore. Um, and it would be very easy for me if I tried to get back to my normal schedule from six weeks ago, it would be very easy to me uh, to injure something. So uh, paying attention to load is very critical on avoiding these overuse injuries and in managing your return from these overuse injuries. Uh, also important is time course and consideration for recovery. Once you have an entrenched case of Achilles tendinopathy or hamstring tendinopathy, you're in for an eight to 10 month course or longer. Um, and understanding how to adjust your activities uh, accordingly is just of paramount importance. But you're absolutely correct. Um, most injuries do not require at absolute rest um, and they shouldn't be rested. Uh, we use too many braces and too many boots on people um, and the consequences of those can be significant when you're trying to get back out there and get active again. Okay, so <clears throat> sh shifting gears a little bit, I, I, well, I, we're actually going back to what we were talking about previously. Um, so you bringing your framework to patients um, in the office, and then that's the same framework that ultimately ended up forming the foundation for your book. So can you describe um, what the steps, what the key areas, and I think there's seven, if I'm remembering correctly, from the book, um, but, but can you just run over what you found are the key areas that you try to get patients to focus on? And then in your experience, is there one or another, like, have you found that, okay, these are the areas, let's focus on this one first, Let, let's get a win here and then expand or how, how have you found it, instituting those, uh, tends to work best for you? Yeah. Um, it can be a challenge. I mean, in our Twitter bubble, right, you know, most of us are active, we're out there doing it, we're doing something, we're running, we're working out. Uh, so it's hard to imagine how people don't like it. But the vast majority of people don't. Exercise is work, it's painful, it's sweaty, it's annoying, it's uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, that's something to, to be avoided. Uh, and so we have to work with people uh, and work with what they're comfortable doing. And if we give them uh, a goalpost that's too far afield, uh, too far downfield, and the goals are too lofty, then when they fail, that's a miserable experience, right? right? Um, so, and that's not going to bring them back to exercise uh, or many healthy lifestyle choices. Um, so I like, you know, my biggest lever for people is exercise. Um, and when I say exercise, I emphasize movement. Um, we can't escape the fact, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of Twitter circles where you have to do HIT. You have to be on an assault bike. You have to be killing yourself. You have to do sprints. You don't, right? If you want to, great. If you want to top off the cardiac benefit and the longevity benefit, fantastic. I'm glad you enjoy it. I enjoy it. So we'll do it. But everyone doesn't need to do it. 
all-cause mortality, right? Dying from any cause. Uh, your chance of dying from en any cause goes down dramatically if you walk as little as six to 8,000 steps a day. So I want people to try and make their day a little harder. I try and impress upon them not to park at the spot that's closest to their, to their office or to their home if they park on the street. Embrace that walk. You don't have to walk a straight line from your car to the front door as well. Same thing at the supermarket. Park at the furthest spot away. Enjoy the walk. Um, by the end of the day, you're going to get five, 6,000 steps in. You know, if you're at work and there's a staircase up, you know, you can walk down three and up two. Um, it shouldn't be a challenge. And the more you do it, the easier that it will become. Um, I talk about exercise snacks uh, on my website. There's nothing wrong with getting up and doing five squats or, or pacing around your office if you're on a Zoom call. You don't have to have your butt stuck to your chair the entire time. Um, and slowly but surely, those those movement patterns uh, become a habit um, and often will extend to a walk after dinner or after lunch, etc. Eating. Eat, eating is important. <laughs> yeah, food is important. Um, we need the energy, right? We need ATP for everything. Um, but energy partitioning and how our body derives it, where it derives its energy from, from which source, glycogen uh, or fat, um, is something we call metabolic flexibility. Um, we can create a lot more energy from burning fat, but in people with metabolic disease, we tend to prefer burning glucose and we lose the ability to burn fat, even at very low effort. Um, so again, just like we can go down, down many rabbit, rabbit holes in the exercise space, we could do the same in food. Um, am I a fan of strict elimination diets? No. Um, as a matter of fact, I've tried many just to see what it was like. I tried keto. Uh, I actually didn't mind it, but my cholesterol shot through the roof, so I stopped that. Um, you know, I've tried purely plant-based. Um, now I'm mostly plants, but I, I enjoy a steak and chicken and fish ch just like everyone else. So I try to emphasize uh, whole food, real food. Um, you know, uh, our foods are highly obesogenic. Um, I don't think we realize how large the uh, food engineering departments in big food companies are. They know precisely the mix in food that's going to make us want to eat more. They know the smell that's going to want us to eat, eat, eat more. When you wash out all the fiber, <clears throat> unfortunately, you also wash out a lot of the nutrients and you wash out the substances in these foods that are going to bring satiety or that feeling of feel, you know, that feeling of being full. So with a low satiety index and, uh, and that, you know, smell and taste that, that keep, keeps bringing you back, um, it's very easy uh, to put on extra weight. Um, so uh, again, I push real foods. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're meat and vegetables. Uh, I implore people, if you're on keto, please watch your ApoB or your LDL particle number. It is important. Uh, it does have a role in cardiac disease causation. Um, Although you'll get yelled at because I said that. No, I, I, I for, for the people that don't know, so I've, I've been low carb for, geez, 2010. So going on almost 13 years. For the vast majority of that time, I ate plenty of plants. Uh, I, I did have right. a period where I went strict carnivore for almost seven months. And I did that. At first, I thought it was super crazy. Um, but I kept reading you know, anecdotes, of course, but I kept reading people that had skin conditions and autoimmune conditions right. and they were finding that it, they, they saw improvements. And I thought, well, I'll try anything for a couple months. I, I'm, I know that's not a long enough 
course of time to really matter in the grand scheme of things. And so I thought, let me try this to see if it helps resolve my skin issues. And lo and behold, it did. Um, but when I, even when I did it, I did a video where I said, hey, I don't, there's no data or anything to make me think that this is the best diet for human longevity. I'm, I'm doing this because I have this condition and I'm trying to find a solution for this uh, without having to throw steroid creams on my, on my skin, you know, for the rest of my life. And so whether Great. it was digestive based, whatever the issue was, and I was obese at one point, I ate so much processed food. It was the standard American diet. I think it maybe was still remnants of, of that something with my digestive system. But once I eliminated everything except for that very limited pellet of foods, uh, the condition resolved. I was able to titrate plant foods back in. I did them kind of like one at a time. And then after uh, several months, nothing was bothering me. So I just kind of opened the floodgates and I eat plenty of vegetables and plants now. Um, even when I was carnivore, um, I still did quite a bit of seafood and I never was, I guess, truly strict because I still cooked with olive oil. I, for whatever reason, I never developed a taste for globs of fat and tallow and all that. I, I, you know, I, even ribeyes, I, I know it's heresy, but I trim the fat off a lot of the fat and stuff like that. So, um, so yes, yeah, st I still am lower on the carbohydrate spectrum, although these days it, it's about 80 grams or sometimes even a little higher per day. So it's not right. terribly low. Um, right. Not that, you know, don't want to make the show about me or anything. But I, I thought, th and that's one of the things that I thought appealed to me with your, your content is, okay, my, my labs are good. And, and they've been good. Um, I think my high LDLC was like 91 at, at that time. I'm actually due for labs again. I was going to go get them drawn last week and I got sick. So I delayed it because obviously my CRP is going to be up. You know, you're, you're sick. Like your, your blood work's right. not going to be representative of your healthy state. So I'll go back right. for labs probably next week. And I'm the type of person where I am willing to change my approach to diet based on my, my biomarkers. Right. Um, and, and I like that you've always you know, had a, a general guidelines and then a tailored approach like, hey, your labs look good. Keep, keep doing what you're doing, right? Oh, hey, right. this is a potentially a concern with your labs. You might want to talk to your doctor and consider lowering, lowering your APOB, for example. Um, I'm not a, a lipidologist and in, within a low-carb community, I know there's people that tell me, don't, stri don't worry about your APOB, don't worry about your LDLC, but I've got kids. And the way I kind of look at it is if all my other – biomarkers are, are good and I can make a small change dietarily and my APOB goes down, there's no negative. So it's not like Correct. I have to no longer, I mean, I don't have to go eat 300 grams of carbs a day. That's not, you know what I mean? So like I can still right. follow the dietary framework that I feel the best with, which is, you know, the moderate to low carb framework. And I can still say, well, I, I eat a little more fish, use a little more olive oil, lower my APOB. Uh, I'm not using tallow. I don't use as much butter as I used to. I don't know. Like, I guess I don't, there's no, there's no benefit to like, Hey, let me get my APOB higher. Like that I, that I can, you know what I mean? No. So I, and I don't. It, Somewhere it is a badge of honor, unfortunately. Um, but, but I think, you know, that's the proper message. You know, what works for one person isn't going to work for everyone else. Um, and we shouldn't force our dietary habits on, on others. Um, and we shouldn't you know, come at them if they question the dogma um, that's firmly out there. Uh, yeah. And... Unfortunately, there are a lot of people now in that a APOB uh, space who are rolling the dice on the biggest wager of their life, right? Um, so, you know, I want to get, I'll steer us off here. Yeah. Um, you know, you will find a diet that works for you. Uh, hopefully it's real food, um, a little more veggie than meat, but just enjoy it. Look, it needs to be sustainable. None of these are quick fixes. Right. So, so whatever you do has to work for you with the, where you can buy them, how much that you can afford, what you like to have, how many mouths you have to feed, etc. There are many, many, many considerations that go into right. this. 
So another thing, sleep, right? There are zero physiological processes in our body that are not adversely affected by lack of sleep. So we are a chronically underslept population. Um, chronically poor sleep leads to increased risk of dementia, cognitive decline, cardiac disease, hypertension, insulin resistance, and all downstream con consequences of that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we have all these folks who optimize their exercise and they optimize their eating patterns, but they don't optimize their sleep schedule. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with going to sleep at nine or 10 o'clock at night. Um, yeah, it's, we really do need seven hours of sleep. Um, some people say eight, I'm in the seven camp, uh, based on what I've read, not upon my own research. Um, <clears throat> and you just feel better. I mean, everyone knows how crappy they feel after a poor night's sleep. Um, just because you may get used to that doesn't mean that you're handling it well. Um, the internal effects are extraordinary. Your brain goes through these uh, cycles uh, at, at night highly repetitive, highly reproducible cycles. Um, sleep is a very active process for our brain. So we park our short-term memories in, in to long-term. We clear out all the garbage, right? We have garbage cells, these glial cells um, in our brain that can clear out the garbage in between the neurons if given enough time to do so. Um, that system can get all messed up if it doesn't have enough cycles. Um, we go through many hormone cycles at night, right? Where the hormones uh, spike at night and then diminish. Uh, it's all part of a circadian rhythm and biological clock. Um, so it's very important to allow our brain uh, to get to that place where it can readjust and recharge itself. <clears throat> As an aside, uh, I think it's really important, you know, your wake up cycle too. Uh, you wanna get your face in the sun uh, without sunglasses for a few minutes in the morning. Uh, you have a pineal gland uh, right behind your eyes. Uh, it starts to spat out these hormones that wakes your brain up and let you know the day is beginning. Um, you know, uh, I think really important and underestimated uh, benefit to achieve health span uh, is having a sense of purpose uh, and having friends, yes. right? What's getting you out of bed in the morning? There has to be something to get you out of bed. There has to be someone uh, that uh, who who thinking about wants to get you out of bed uh, or drives you out of bed. Well, the, the retirement. <laughs> Poorly That's phrased. That's kind of like the retirement trap, right? Where people retire and they lose their since they, they've tied their identity to their profession absolutely, um, or, or, or the friends at work absolutely. or whatever. So they, they stop going to the workplace and their health it happened to my mom. I mean, my mother's a perfect example. She was a hairdresser. She retired. Her health immediately started to tank. Um, and, and so right. I think that is ties into your point. People, when they retire for a lot of people work is what gives them a sense of purpose, you know, and then they lose right. that, but also leaving the house, like you mentioned for some physical activity, to go to work, they lose that. So, so I think it's right. probably multifactorial in that that retirement age where it it's you know you're skating on thin ice if you don't have a plan to transition away from retirement into something else to make you want to get up and 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 and, and live. You know. Absolutely. Well, look, you know, we can't escape the fact that as we age, we lose abilities. Um, <clears throat> but we gain others. There's some some great books that are written about this, right? It's fluid intelligence that drives us when we're young. Um, uh, and uh, that's the accumulated knowledge and the knowledge that we got from the books and our strength and our ability to work all day and all night as surgeons and whoever. Um, but those abilities fail. Uh, I have a lot of friends saying, you know, God, you know, I'm just killed by surgery now. I, you know, I'm exhausted. Um, what should I do to train for that? 
like you can't right it's it's just gonna go away um but we gain it's called crystalline knowledge as we get older because now we know how to synthesize all this knowledge that we have in our data banks um and we combine that with our real life experience and we can turn that into truly meaningful and actionable knowledge to share with people. So uh, it's sort of accepting the changes that are going to occur with aging and our ability to start to share the crystal knowledge that we have. That's to a large degree why I still write, why I do podcasts, why I wrote a book and why I'm planning on another. So, okay, so you talked about the two types of intelligence, um, and I think that to, to people probably makes some intuitive sense um, because it seems like as we get later in years to, you know, the, the grandparent age. So my oldest is 16, so I'm not, I'm not quite there yet, but it seems like there is a – they seem to make better teachers, and they seem to be better at passing on knowledge and helping to guide uh, future generations, maybe a little more patient um, – and what I found, I'm 43, so again, I'm not old, but I've, I really enjoy teaching people um, what I've learned or my cumulative experience. I find, you know, a satisfaction in that, that when I was younger, I, I didn't really care about. Um, so I definitely think that there is some intuitive truth. <laughs> it's all Hold good, on one man. second. No, Sorry, it's a, I, I've got two myself. So, um, but yeah, I, I think to to your point, understanding that that change happens can help you not have a midlife crisis uh, when you start having the skills that maybe helped you earlier in your career, whatever that happens to be, when they're not as sharp as they were. Okay, Correct. now how do I make the most of how I'm transitioning uh, to to maintain my sense of purpose? So, if you were known as you know, the, the big time surgeon and you're, and you're, and you're doing back to back surgeries or these marathon surgeries, whatever the case is. And those things are starting to wipe you out and you can't maintain them without it taking a toll on you. Uh, I think at a certain point, if you know that that is an inevitable part of transitioning into this later stage in life, um, then you can do that successfully and still find immense gratification. I, I'm sure there's, you know, like in your case, writing a book. So I'm sure there are surgeons that, Hey, I, I love to teach now. Uh, I, I like to help influence right. the, the younger, maybe, maybe they're publishing papers at, at a faster rate, um, contributing to the body of literature. So whatever, whatever your, your area of interest is, I think understanding that this change takes place and making sure that you're addressing, maintaining a sense of purpose, um, is important. And then the one that I think is, is also key. And, and it really interests me because in the social media age, we have friends in a different way than we traditionally had friends. So I have people that I've met through social media that I'm like, man, I really like this person. We, we see eye to eye on a lot of things. We have really good conversations, but I've never seen them in person. So I, I, I wonder how much the, the – when you look at um, populations that have exceptional longevity, when you look around the world – they're having friends gets them out of the house. They're social. They go visit these people. They walk. So I wonder how much of it is the physical activity at later age that happens as a part of these friendships and how much is attributed to the friendships themselves helping add to your sense of purpose. Well, I've got to wake up to converse with so-and-so I've got, I've got people to live for, you know? So to me, I don't know how to, how to separate those two things. And it's like, I really enjoy Awesome. I've got people that I want to interact with online. I learned from this person. I, you know, we, we, so I, I feel like though, to me, intuitively, those relationships have to matter. Like the, you know, it's, I know people often say, well, it's not real life. It's, it's Twitter, but it is real life because real life is changing with the advance of technology. Um, so have you, have you thought about that at all? Like, you know, how you balance your, your in-person relationships versus those that you've maybe, um, you know, ma made online? Yeah. So a lot of my online relationships have turned into very important uh, real life relationships. Um, 
And that was always fascinating. You know, I've been on Twitter since 2008 or nine, I think. Um, uh, two of the businesses that, uh, one that I founded, um, I met two guys through Twitter. We met in San Diego and, you know, we went from there. Um, so my online friendships, uh, have been very important. Uh, but it's my real life relationships that, uh, I derive m most satisfaction from, um, you know, whether it's just, you know, a quick drink, a coffee, a quick snack, you know, a run, um, you know, I used to run alone and only ran alone. Um, now I'm sort of half and half, uh, and I, I really enjoy running with some people. Um, yeah, others not so much, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, you know, whether it's the fact that you're walking with friends or, uh, that you're exercising your, you know, your cognitive strength, um, pulling facts from the depths of your memory or just it's lower stress. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think anyone right. knows. Um, but and like this longevity talk, it's not just one thing. There's no single path that's going to work. Um, but it's an extremely important uh, aspect of healthy aging because because longevity really is um, an epidemic. Um, and we've lost a lot of meaningful relationships. Uh, through the years, or we just text instead of picking up a phone or driving to their house, you know, walk into their house if they're a neighbor. Um, those are meaningful moments. Uh, and I think they have a far more significant impact on us than, than we imagine. Yeah, it, the technology for all of its, you know, all, for all the good that it does, um, has, it's a double-edged sword and there's a dark side to it. And I, I think, like you talked about, we, we make more connections than ever, but maybe less deep and less meaningful um, than right. they once were. Uh, reduced physical activity. I, th I think at the end of the day, when you look at a lot of the advice throughout your book, it can essentially be boiled down to replacing that which technology has removed from, from our daily lives, right? We, we used to have to walk a lot. We used to have to do a lot of moderate to low intensity physical activity just, just to survive. Right. We no longer have to do that. Um, and so it, when you look at the, whether it's the Okinawans, the Greeks, even if you look at these hunter gatherer populations who seem to have very robust metabolic health, uh, their physical activity levels are, are super high, but they're not, right. yes, they're, they're not high intensity. They're not, running 26 might you know they're walking right. 10 miles a day or, or, right. or rowing canoes and right. so i think I, I used to when i was younger up until the last probably the last like five six years especially about 2015 i used to just lift and then for the cardiovascular health i thought okay well this metabolic metcon style conditioning i'll just do some real high intensity weightlifting, get my heart rate cranked up for 20 minutes and i'm good and then when I started really looking at humans as this, and we are, we're this creature that I, I think we're either tops or close to tops on the planet for endurance capacity. And so I started realizing like, you know, my training, my lifestyle, I don't walk anywhere. I'm driving everywhere. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do lift, I do exercise plenty, but I realized like I'm not, I'm not doing this movement, this, this endurance based movement that we've evolved for. And I started realizing that all the exercise I'm doing, while yes, it's strengthening my musculoskeletal system, and yes, it's good for me, it's all glycolytic. The energy system I'm using is all, you know, the creatine phosphate glycolytic energy system. So I have this aerobic energy system that I'm virtually is untouched. But as I started digging right. into this, I realized it's worse than that because it's not just that it's not developed. It's that I'm overdeveloping the other energy systems in relation to, to this one. So... Um, and, and I, I definitely wanted to talk to you about this topic. It's one of the, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you because I think most people, the average person, especially number one, get up, get active, get moving. That's the most important thing, whatever the heck it looks like. If you're at a CrossFit box, if you're, whatever you're doing, great, keep doing it, I, I, you know, 
But I think that most people don't view walking as exercise. They don't view, I never did until recently, you know, and, and for most people, and, you know, we can talk about, they've maybe heard of heart rate zones they see on their Apple watch. There, there's a reason to spend time in different heart rate zones. And so I think once you're like, cool, I've got to get up, I've got to get active. Great. You're active. Now, once you're no longer sedentary up moving around, like what's the benefit of zone one, zone two. And because I think a lot of people, they start exercising, they fly right past those two zones and everything's three, four, five, three, four, five. And so it's, it's not a complicated t concept. And we can, you know, the biology, if you really want to dig into it, which you don't have to, can be complicated, but the premise behind it is, is pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Um, so if you could maybe just briefly talk about what those zones represent energy system wise and why it's important to train the different zones, especially, you know, one and two. And you mentioned mitochondrial health um, being kind of, you know, foundational for healthy aging. And so if you could kind of just tie that together. Um, I, I know it can be a complicated, <laughs> but, but, but I know that the zone two, you see it all over Twitter, zone two, zone two. So I think with the way you distilled your book. Right. It got, it got overplayed, right? Um, and it just became a catchphrase. Uh, and it's very poorly understood. You know, I get pulled into a lot of conversations on Twitter about low heart rate training. Um, and it really is very, very poorly understood. So, yeah. So if, you know, the best trained endurance athletes in the world um, are trained uh, such that the vast majority of their training is low heart rate. And believe it or not, it's zone one. Because zone two, when you're that fit, is a significant effort, right? If you can put out 250, 300 watts in zone two, <laughs> you're working really hard. And in these years, Samalan and others who teach, you know, the world, these world-class cyclists and triathletes are very clear. They don't want their racers um, doing much in the upper zones. Why? What are the benefits? Um, <clears throat> most of us are fat oxidation deficient. You can call it aerobic deficiency syndrome, as it's coined um, by Phil Maffetone uh, and, 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 and others. But what's happening is we're fat oxidation deficient. So energy partitioning, where do we derive en energy from? You eat, you digest it, breaks down, it goes into your blood. Um, in the ideal world, our mitochondria, uh, our cells, are processing fat for energy. It comes with lower oxidative stress. It comes with uh, lower inflammatory burden, uh, less reactive oxygen species, because we're not pushing hard, um, as with a HIT, less cardiac strain, less of a recovery burden, less of an injury burden. So those are some of the reasons why we don't want to do too much exercise, too high a rate exercise. Back to the, my, the mitochondria. Our mitochondria prefer to burn fat. Uh, it's more efficient. Um, they should burn fat up to a certain point, your lactic acid threshold, uh, the first, uh, the first, thre first threshold, where we're slowly building our lactate because we are, we have a little glycolysis going on to burning glucose, but we're preferentially burning fat uh, to make energy. As we, our energy demands increase, fat oxidation can't keep pace, oxygen supply can't keep pace, and we switch over to glycolysis, um, which does not require o oxygen. And <clears throat> In the ideal world, we don't switch over fully to glycolysis until we're running, until we're cycling at a decent clip, or swimming at a decent clip, or hiking hard uphill. But what's happening now 
is the vast majority of people have very poor metabolic health. And as you mentioned, they're flying through um, this energy, energy partitioning immediately upon being active. So these folks are in glycolysis walking, uh, in glycolysis going upstairs. How do we know? Um, <clears throat> we can test them. Uh, we can do ventilatory testing on them. Um, we can do lactate testing on them. Uh, and I've done this in the office. Uh, I brought my lactate meter to work. And I'll have people with resting lactate levels of 2 millimole, 1.8 millimole. And that 1.8 to 2.1 millimole is where most people start their tra tra transition from zone 2 to zone 3. As you pointed out, many runners even, when they start running, by the time you leave the trailhead, your heart rate is 160 and you've left zone one and two behind. Uh, and you're in three heading into four. Why? <clears throat> Phil Maffetone and others you know, would say you have aerobic deficiency syndrome. You're just blowing right through these zones because you do not have a well-equipped aerobic or fat oxidation system or engine. Uh, what are the consequences of that? Well, you're going to start to run out of energy because you're just blowing through your glycogen. Um, two, as I said, more reactive oxygen species, more of an inflammatory burden post-exercise, um, <clears throat> higher recovery needs, <clears throat> higher cardiac strain, and depending on your health, that may be important. Um, and a higher risk of injury. So what's the importance of wanting to build up your zone one and two or ability to oxidize fat? First of all, your health, right? If you're not capable of burning fat, and you have that poor metabolic flexibility, inability to burn fat, your mitochondria are not functioning well. That leaves you a very high risk of developing or you have insulin resistance. And you probably have hypertension, you have an increased risk uh, of dementia. There's a reason why we, we, we call dementia type 3 diabetes, because it is an energy par partitioning problem. So about 30 to 40 percent of cases of dementia could probably be avoided <clears throat> by improving our metabolic health. So Let's say you are a runner and you want to improve, or a cyclist, you want to improve your ability uh, to uh, run further, uh, run at a pace where you're less tired, um, where your energy needs are less, etc. cetera. Um, by stressing uh, zone one and two running, which may not be running initially, maybe walk runs and just walks, you will build resilience, you will build capacity, you'll build endurance in your running and you'll build your endurance as a runner and be able to run longer. Um, and that would be reflected if you, te you tested as lower lactate at the same pace. So before I started all of this many years ago, I would run at a certain pace on my average run, 158, 160. You know, I was up around my second lactate acid threshold uh, and I was a little out of breath and when I got back to the car I felt tired if I ran long um, so I spent years doing low heart rate training um, and the, at first I was 12 minute miles 11 and a half minute miles it was awful um, but I got that down and it keeps going down and some of them are more gifted uh, luckily some have gotten it a lot lower than I have <clears throat> but I can come off a trail now <clears throat> running nine and a half minute miles. I can run 12 miles. So there's no end, uh, zone creep where um, I'm creeping up in from zone two to three. There's no heart rate creep or drift uh, where my heart rate is slowly in, in, increasing. That's, that's where I'm at. And I, get, and I get into my car uh, and I feel great. And I get home and I get out of my car and I feel great. So, you know, the, the burden on my recovery is markedly diminished um, <clears throat> and the health benefits are indisputable. And again, if you want to build your running performance, fantastic. You know, 
do some sprints at the end of a long run, do some hill repeats, do you know, a threshold run once a week, um, but do it intelligently and don't dismiss the, the importance of building your ability to oxidize fat. Yeah, I, I think the important thing there you touched on, even in some runners, it's going to be a brisk walk is going to be one, zone one, zone two. So that means that if, if someone's listening to this and they're most people, for most people, you say, okay, well, there's health benefits to, there's mitochondrial health benefits um, to me doing this type of training. How do I know if I'm, you know, zone two? For most people, if you just go on a brisk walk, you know, not, not a light stroll, but a brisk walk, you're, you're there. I mean, that's pretty much it. You do that for 30 minutes um, and, and that's giving you time. That's going to help at least for a while. Um, that's going to help condition that energy system. And so I think for most people, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's almost like there's this voodoo to, <laughs> to zone two. And it's like, no, just go on a brisk walk for most people. Even if it, even if you're a fairly fit person, that, so maybe you're at the low, at the lower end of zone two, maybe you're even zone one and, and maybe just a little bit of zone two. F from what I'm seeing, zone one, zone two, the crossover, it's, it's all good. Any time you spend in that type of light physical activity is hugely beneficial. So, cause, cause I, I was fairly confused. I mean, without lactate testing and, and, you know, mo most people are not going to buy meters and, and prick their skin and test right. their blood and all that. Um, and when I first started, okay, I got, I, I'm going to try to do some more, you know, zone two to build this aerobic base coming from a, a history of, of neglecting it. I, I would set out on a jog. And I mean, I was, I used to run and I'd go on a jog and I'd see people jogging super slow. And I was like, this loser over here. <laughs> like, that looks boring. What are you doing? I'm like, how can you do that? It's so boring, you know? Um, and so, but once I, understood i was like that guy's smarter than me you know <laughs> so i but i i would to your point you made I, I would have to run so slow right and i still do i mean like you mentioned 12 and a half 13 minute miles it's like a trot uh but right. i i've done it where i've gone for 45 minutes or an hour and you're right you're not tired afterwards you stop running and you're like oh like I, I'm, let me make dinner let me do. yeah you're fine good. like you, you i mean you exercised you did and you feel good but you you're not fatigued um, so, so it's the, the difference in reduced recovery times for that type of training are, are, are readily apparent. Um, but I think the barrier to it, 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 it needs to be demystified for most people. If you just leave the house, take your dogs, go on a brisk walk, uh, very light jog, if that, yep. uh, and if you have some kind of monitor where you can check your heart rate, you know, f for, for the individual it will vary, but you know, heart rate of 110, even your zone one ish you know, 120, zone two, depending on your conditioning level, it, you don't, it doesn't need to get very high. And so the activity doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be very intense. And like you mentioned, for a lot of people, and this was my case, running was too much. I had to run, rock, run, walk, run, walk. I ended up just buying a bike for the house. Um, and, and part of that was just because I have kids. I can't always just go leave the house when I want to go on a run. Right. Um, I, I have to work my exercise around my family. So wake up, hop on the bike, watch Netflix, um, which I know is, is, is supposedly terrible. Nobody should be watching TV. We should all just be working. <laughs> um, but I, I will. I, I'm like, oh, a new, new Lord of the Rings series or whatever. And, you know, 45 minutes right. goes by pretty quick. My kids are asleep. Very, very right. Sad. And so, so for me, the bike has helped. But that's kind of where I'm at. If, if I go on a run now, I still get some heart rate creep after about 25 minutes. Um, so I'm working to try to eliminate that. Uh, and, and for for people who don't know, that just means you take off and you're at for let's say it's a 129 ish heart rate, and you go okay, I'm good. And so you're running at like 12 minute miles or whatever, and then you you go th three miles in, all of a sudden you see your heart rate go up 10 beats per minute uh, over a, a, a two to three minute period. And so that's the point where now even at the same effort, you're 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 out of that zone, right. and your heart rate's creeped up. So what I've been doing is as soon as I see my heart rate start to creep up, I just pack it in and that that's the end of that session um so or you yeah walk. exactly exactly if, if i have time i i don't have no yeah, I it, it. It, it's been it's happening at around 30 minutes so i'm pretty much like okay if i'm on a run that's that's about the end of it <laughs> I, I head back home um on the bike it's easy because i can just notch it down a little bit and you know keep, right. keep my heart rate where i want it um but yeah i think that was a 
it's much easier to make the transition to low heart rate exercise on a bike than it is. Yeah, running. yeah, it could. It'll be much, much less frustrating. Yeah, it, it really is. That's why I ultimately went with the bike because I was like, "Geez, man, I, 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 I literally <laughs> have to like trot. <laughs> it's like a shuffle, and it, it like the shuffle is so unnatural. You, your late, your shin, shin, shins, your legs. You know, it's it's not a good movement pattern. And so I was right. like, okay, this. But you know, I I did that. You know, as I said, when I I'm running at the same pace now, well, pre-COVID. Um, uh, pre six weeks ago, COVID. I'm running at the same pace now that my heart rate was 155, 158. It's now 122 to 126. Right at, at the same speed. At the same. So pace. that. At the same. So pace. that's how you can because then then you know people are going to say okay cool I I can do this right like m- most parents my kids we bought bikes I'm going to go ride some bikes I mean you can make it a you can make your zone one zone two leisure type activity it d- doesn't have Absolutely. to be you out on the trail, you know, or, or whatever, away from your family, you, you can, you can bring them along. I actually take my youngest to the park and there's a park near the house where it's just teeming with kids. There's always tons of kids. And so, you know, if we go to a a not busy park, my kid wants me to play with him. When we go to this particular park, I'm invisible. He just wants to play with the other kids. And, and it's set up where there's a, a circular sidewalk around this. It's not huge, but I mean, it's enough. I can just shove, I can do a super slow run. So I'll take the kid to play and I'll just run around in a circle and watch him, you know, run around the equipment yep. basically. And I'll, I'll run for 40 minutes and then I'll just take him and, and then we'll go grab, you know, something to eat, go home. Uh, but, but I'm turning fun time at the park into some time that I can, I can get a little, you know, that low intensity physical activity. Absolutely. And so I, I just want to make sure people understand that it, you don't have to be a runner quote unquote. You don't have to be a cyclist as a regular person, especially if you have poor mitochondrial health you can totally do this type of activity, you know, work it into your into your daily life. Be that, like I do, a bike, watching TV. Uh, my kid will be watching. The other day we watched Avengers, and I'm on the bike, and he's next to me. You know, he doesn't care that I'm on the bike. Like, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's old enough. He's not on my lap or watching TV anyways, so so right. it's totally fine. Um, so w- one of the things that I-, I wanted to make sure I talked to you about, and I liked your book because it, it's definitely the book that you can you can buy and you can gift to people who you want to improve their health who are not interested in the health and longevity space. There, there's no buzzwords. It's it's written it's written super super plainly. So like if I bought it for my dad, if I bought it for they would understand it, right? They don't need to ask what things mean. The terms that you use are clearly explained and defined. Um, but one of the things is there's there's not a section on like you know longevity exogenous molecules and supplements and that kind of stuff, uh, so I I wanted to get your reasoning and I'm I'm pretty sure I know what it is but but get your reasoning why you decided not to go into that in, into that um, you know that that space or or even touch on that aspect of longevity, uh, and like I said I think I know why but. Yeah. So, because I wanted to focus on simple, actionable steps that work and that you can start uh, employing today. Um, you know, longevity science with regards to molecules is pretty unsettled, right? You know, for every per- person who says you, know, you should eat low protein you'll find two that says you shouldn't. You should eat high protein. Then <laughs> you'll, you know, find people who said, you know, you should eat eat resveratrol. Um, well, it turns out that that data was inaccurate and it's not going to help you. Um, you know, certain online folks started taking metformin. Uh, they stopped taking it but somehow that didn't get to the audience. So there's, I run into a lot of people who are still taking metformin because so-and-so take it, is taking it. Yet that study, you know, that's currently being funded and done uh, isn't out yet. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about rapamycin. Um, and some people are, have bought in. They're all in on this. Uh, again, I, 
the research isn't out there yet. We don't know the dose. We don't know the frequency. We don't know the long-term downside effects of, uh, of it. So we're not going to find longevity as of right now in a pill bottle uh, or on a shelf. Um, it's just not plainly available. Uh, and we don't know a lot of the consequences of, of some of the very powerful agents that some people are, are taking. Um, so I, I didn't want to touch on that subject because there's just too little that's known. Um, and you know, too many people will too often reach for the pill <laughs> instead of go out on a walk. So I wanted to keep the message uh, pretty simple. Well, the, the thing that um, with, so you mentioned like Matt Foreman, the thing that was interesting to me about that when that, there's a study that came out that showed that metformin use uh, could impair adaptations to exercise. So maybe it's making your exercise less beneficial. Uh, so the thing that I right. found interesting and, and I'll, you know, th there's a well-known longevity expert um, published, well credentialed and all that. And th this individual, even though they, they, you would think like they know what to do, they have a hard time uh, applying, you know, they don't exercise enough. They don't sleep yeah. well enough. They're, like when you listen to them tell you what they do, you're like, make, you're not even doing the, like e even people that know better, it's like they, they right. go out of their way to try not to exercise to like, you know, right. so, so I, I, they're not doing steps one, two, three, and four. So, you know, they're not ready for the rapamycin. Right. Um, and, 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 and oh, yeah. go ahead. No, go the, ahead. The thing that I, the thing that kind of stood out to me is almost all of these molecules that are supposed to, you know, enhance human longevity, they share common pathways mechanistically with exercise, with caloric restriction, with these other things. So it also stands to reason that that the better your metabolic health and the more you employ the, the proven thing. So the better you sleep, you exercise, you eat, the healthier you are, the less advantageous it seems that these types of things are going to be. So the people that are the most interested in optimizing for longevity are probably the very people that will get the smallest potential benefit from any of those things. Assuming right. those things, you know, assuming there's one that says, oh, this really works. You know, metformin, for example, I looked into it and I was like, right. well, I, no. Like, why would I take this? I already, my body already does all this efficiently, you know? Right. Um, so, so, yeah. I, no, you're right. There are, you know, there are three huge levers, you know. Again, I think that the biggest one is exercise. The second uh, is nutrition. And when I say exercise, I mean movement and strength, uh, training or muscle mass maintenance. Uh, the second is nutrition and food. Uh, uh, and the third is sleep. And unless you're pulling all those triggers, those three triggers as hard as you can and working them, you know, the additional benefit of rabamycin uh, or metformin is going to be very low. Uh, and if you're not doing the first three, it might be even lower. We just don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> so w one other... One other question that I wanted to wanted to pose to you, um, because I think it's it's beneficial in light of you just got over recently having a COVID case. Uh, I, I also had it year, a few years ago, and then I just had my my daughter. I had to pick her up early from school. She was sick. I got sick. My son got sick. Everybody was throwing up. It was like a, a five six day thing. Uh, I mean, it, it it was pretty bad. It felt like crap. Um, but <laughs> w one of the things that I've changed my stance on you know when i was younger if i got sick i was trying to get back to exercise as quick as i could and now having a little little larger knowledge base um but also having better ha having better equipment to to kind of monitor my health with uh and you don't have to have anything fancy but but i do have an apple watch i sleep with it and it gives you your, your sleeping heart rate and so what i observed is I was sick. I started to feel better, but my, my sleeping and resting heart rates are like five to seven beats per minute higher a, a week, you know, 
out of being sick, out of already feeling better. And so seeing that, I, I go, okay, well, I'm going to start out with lighter exercise. I'm zone one, zone two. E- even my, my resistance training, I'm taking longer rest periods and I'm, I'm giving myself basically a lower intensity session uh, with my strength training this week. And so today's the first day my heart rate's starting to dip back down. You having had COVID and, and being an athlete, having been sick in the past, like what, what is your advice to people and how do you approach, number one, training when dealing with sickness? But then once you're on the other side of the sickness and you think, oh, I feel good, how do you um, titrate your, your, how do you suggest people titrate their training back in? Yeah. Um, so it's, oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's all good. Sorry. So that's a great question. Um, and it's not easy to answer. <laughs> After having COVID recently, I looked for hard and fast answers and they don't exist. Um, one key principle is go back slowly, especially with flu and COVID, uh, because these, like what everyone attributes to a post COVID syndrome, it's also a post viral syndrome, yeah, including the flu, uh, which can knock you back on your ass for a few months uh, easily in some cases. I know people like me in my own in my own runner circle who had COVID and within a week to 10 days, they were running, tolerating it well. We watched their heart rates, everything was fine. Um, I think it was a little early to get back into it, but you know, every parameter uh, that they were willing to monitor looked okay. So for me, um, I was like you, my aggressing heart rate was 20 beats above normal. <laughs> For the first two weeks, uh, my respiration my my respiration rate was high. My HRV was in was in a cesspool. Um, so it was very clear that my body was telling me, "Don't do this." Um, I decided to look deeper, so I got some blood tests and my inflammatory markers, CRP, fibrinogen. Etc. were off the charts. My liver enzymes were up. Um, I never checked my cardiac enzymes. Um, <clears throat> so it was clear that I had to let this resolve uh, before I started to head back out. Um, as my resting heart rate started to recover, my HRV started to tick back up uh, to normal, um, I started walking because walking works. Um, and I was having a more exaggerated heart rate response to walking than I should have. I shouldn't have had much of a response at all. Um, and I wouldn't have six, six weeks ago, but I was. So I decided to <clears throat> wait until that s- started to improve. So when I saw a less of a cardiac burden with, with walking, better recovery, heart rates, um, Again, lower HRV in the morning, lower resting heart rate in the morning. Uh, I started to walk further. I started to walk hills. I started to take the dogs for a walk for a solid hour and a half or so. Um, And that came with a recovery burden at first. Uh, So, you know, I recognized, you know, what my HRV was and resting heart rate the day after a longer bout of walking. And as that started to improve, you know, the other day I started running. Um, you know, I'm running slower than usual. I had, you know, the heart rate is a little higher, but I'm going to continue to do the same thing. Uh, I recovered from a stress fracture a number of years ago, and it's not too dissimilar. You know, I was out for eight weeks, and it just took me a long time to get back. But, uh, you know, I, I want to avoid <laughs> re-injuring myself. Uh, I want to, you know, COVID just does some nasty things to all of our tissues. Um, and uh, the effects on the cardiac system, uh, our conduction system, and our mitochondria uh, are just profound. Um, so I'm just going to let it run its course and do its thing. And I'm 
adding on my my activity wisely. Um, but again, I would watch your resting heart rate, watch your respiratory rate. Uh, if you do wear a watch um, uh, or have an aura, uh, <clears throat> check your HRV. Uh, see what your response is to the exercise. See what you what you are in the morning, and guide use that as a guide to getting back out there. But it's going to take you longer than you think uh, in most instances uh, to to return, especially if you've been out for a few weeks. Yeah, you, I found the same thing. Um, now, a heart rate variability HRV um, it, it is a way to measure the health or the functioning um, of your autonomous nervous system. So um, can you maybe touch on, because I know you, you, I think you're the only person that I've seen make this connection uh, between the musculoskeletal system and the autonomous nervous system and how when HRV is going down, uh, indicating, you know, high, high stress load on the autonomous nervous system, you see injury rates going up. Uh, HRV can be measured, Apple watches, I think, Samsung watches, Garmin. There, there's a lot of them that can do it now. And I understand there's chest straps and aura rings. So we don't have to get into what the best piece of equipment is or any of that. But for, for people sure. that do have a piece of equipment or are considering it, um, what, like, what's the utility of them paying attention to the HRV and you know, at, at a real high level using HRV to help guide their decisions when it comes to you know, when to train, how hard to train? Sure. Uh, so a HRV uh, comes about because our heart does not beat regularly. <clears throat> if your heart, if your pulse is 60, you don't have a heartbeat every one second. You'll have it 0.99 seconds, 1.1 seconds, 0.96 seconds, etc. And the differences or variability between those beats will determine your heart rate variability. More complex, but suffice it to say. <clears throat> your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems both comprise the autonomic nervous system. And your sympathetic nervous system or the flight and fright response um, drives your HRV down and makes your heart rate more regular. The parasympathetic nervous system is your chill nervous system. It's getting you to be able to relax, to concentrate, etc. That will increase your HRV for the most part. So once you have a baseline established and you know what your HRV is, you can then observe trends that are going to occur like illness or overtraining, uh, too little training, too much training. These are all going to impact upon your, your HRV. You can imagine if you're training more, maybe a little too much, your sympathetic nervous system, the flight and fright response, um, is going to be overactive. So your HRV is going to drop. Um, and if you're well rested and you've recovered, um, exercise will will boost your your hrv so if you were inactive you had an hrv of 25 and now you're starting to become active you're walking more you're moving more you may notice that it's you know 35 36. Um, you may notice after exercise it goes down to 24 the next day okay it's telling you you know not necessary to stop but chill out not a hard day uh, so HRV is useful for me on a long-term signal and a short-term signal. It, 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 it anticipated that I was going to get sick the day before I got sick, uh, and sometimes more than a day. And when I felt better, <laughs> clearly the data was showing me that I wasn't. Um, as a runner, my HRV has foretold almost all of my injuries because I tend to ramp up, you know, towards the end of the winter. Um, I have a bunch of races that I like to run in the spring. Uh, but in general, 
I put the load on a bit too fast. So if, if I look back almost, you know, the second week of May every year, I, I have to drop off in terms of my running. Uh, and my HRV warned me that because you'll start to see it level off or drop and you'll have some lower days in a row. Um, and it's just telling you, you're training too much. Um, so you have to, if you monitor your loads and you monitor your HRV, um, you'll see the correlations there and you'll find it a very useful signal. Um, <clears throat> I personally, I love the HRV for training app, right? By Marco Altini. Um, it's a single app. You don't need to buy a Whoop subscription or a $400 Aura Ring, uh, $12 app. Um, it measures your HRV using your uh, phone camera. Uh, it's been validated uh, many times. It's very accurate. And the data behind it is very useful without a doubt. Now, when it comes to HRV and how to um, apply the data you gather there toward, you know, toward tailoring your exercise load, when it comes to uh, musculoskeletal injury and, and considerations for how to seek care for those things, uh, when it comes to how to know how much zone two versus, you know, if you're doing too much zone three to five, all the stuff we've talked about, you actually have a pretty, uh, a pretty robust, uh, you know, offering of articles on your website. So I want to make sure that I, I plug that um, because I've actually sent t to my own clients. I've, I've had more than one client where they are uh, fr from an old injury that maybe wasn't resolving and they're, they're considering going under the knife. And I'm like, oh, make sure you read this and this, you know, <laughs> not, not telling them don't listen to your doctor, just telling right. them, hey, here, here's an, you know, here's an ortho that can give you some, you know, kind of an alternative opinion um, or, or something for you to discuss, you know, with your doctor. So right. I definitely wanted to make sure before we conclude that if people want additional information about any of the stuff that we've kind of gone over here, number one, your book is great. Uh, and, and I can't stress enough with a book. It's the perfect book to gift to people that you want to get healthier and you want it to be accessible, you know, to them. It's not David Sinclair's book. It's not this technical you know, if, if you're wanting to geek out on the science, it's not, that's not this book. You know, this book is going to be the book to try to help bring other people into the fold and improve their health uh, in, in a, in a easy, easy to grasp way. Um, but again, your website's a wealth of information. I encourage people to go there. And then you're, you're very active on Twitter. I encourage people to go check you out on Twitter, uh, which is just your, your name, right? HJ Lux, HJLEK. Okay. So you can check him out on Twitter. Like I said, he's active there. Check out his website. Uh, email list, all that good stuff. Um, it, it was a pleasure interviewing you, Howard. I, I had a good time. Uh, hopefully people found this beneficial. And uh, one of these days I plan to make it out and, and, and you can take me on a run. Fantastic, Jerry. Right, thank you for being here. Thank you, my yeah. friend. Have a great evening.